During the early days of the pandemic, we noticed that everyone was turning into some sort of an expert. People were dishing out advice as if they are statisticians or even doctors. And uh, I don't have any such intention to talk about uh, a field which I'm not aware of. However, there is a term from the field of uh, epidemiology which I found extremely interesting and it caught my attention. And that term is called R0. R0 is basically the average number of people who will contract an infectious disease from a person who has that disease. Or to put it simply, it's a way to understand how much a disease is going to spread amongst a certain population. And this got me thinking about my own area of expertise, which is marketing. I was wondering if there is a term in marketing or if there is a measure within marketing which can give us a sense of how likely a brand's loyalty is about to spread or grow. And in today's video, I'm going to talk about one such measure which comes the closest to the R0 from the epidemiology world. The world of marketing is vast, complex and rapidly evolving. But with just a bit of help, it can be a lot of fun. On this channel, I simplify real-world marketing for all the curious minds out there. Hi, I'm Rahul and this is the business of marketing. If you are new to this channel, kindly hit the subscribe button now. And if you have any thoughts or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. I will do my best to respond to all of them and create new content accordingly. So let's dive straight into the world of epidemiology to understand what exactly is R0. The basic reproductive number denoted by R0 of an infection can be thought of as the expected number of cases directly generated by one case in a population where all individuals are susceptible to infection. It is important to note that the value of R0 is applicable only when three conditions are met and these are when no one in the population has been vaccinated, when no one has had the infection earlier, when there exists no way to control or limit the spread of the disease. The combination of these three factors is important to how susceptible the population is when it comes to the spread of an infectious disease. However, thanks to modern day science as well as education, there is little chance of all of these factors coming together. As a result, what happens is that a lot of diseases from the past which were extremely contagious in nature are probably not as contagious in modern times or uh, in, in some cases they are even completely curable in the modern days. To calculate the value of R0, there are complex mathematical models which are applied. But if I were to oversimplify this and explain it in an easier way, there would be two key parts to it. On one side, it is the characteristic of the virus or the bacteria or the germ or the pathogen which is uh, involved. And on the other side is the likelihood of people coming in contact with each other. And while the first part is easier to calculate and find out, it is the second part which becomes extremely tricky to arrive at a definitive answer. Which is why R0 is a tricky measure to work with, especially in scenarios where there are external influences such as the government imposing restrictions on people coming in contact with each other through things like lockdowns or you know people wearing masks or even uh, stipulating safe distancing measures. However, despite these factors, R0 continues to be an important way to try and understand the risk of a disease turning into a outbreak and also to understand the effectiveness of the intervention methods which are being put in place. There are three possible scenarios that you can read with the help of R0. If the value of R0 is greater than 1, there is a high chance of the disease turning into an outbreak because one person can infect more than one person. When the value of R0 is equal to 1, there is a possibility that the disease will continue to survive but it will probably not turn into an outbreak. But uh, when the value of R0 is less than 1, there is a lower chance of the disease turning into an outbreak and probably it will uh, uh, come to its natural conclusion uh, within a short period of time. And understanding R0 a little closely made me realize uh, and wonder if there is something which is similar in our world, in the world of marketing and communication. And there is something which I found which resembles it not exactly but closely 
and that is what was developed by Bain and Company in 2003 which is known as Net Promoter Score. So let's dive a little deeper into what exactly is Net Promoter Score and try and understand the similarities and the differences between NPS and R0. Net Promoter Score or NPS is a metric to understand customer perception and the loyalty of customers towards a company or a brand. It is calculated using a survey and the data is reported as a score between minus 100 to plus 100 where the higher the score the better it is for the brand or the company which is being surveyed. The method of calculating net promoter score is actually quite simple. It is supposed to be a one question survey and the question that is asked is how likely is that you would recommend organization X or brand Y or service Z or product Q or whatever it is to a friend or a colleague. And to answer the question, a scale of 0 to 10 is provided with 10 being extremely likely to recommend. Depending on the score that a respondent assigns, uh, they are segregated into three kinds of categories. The first one is promoters. It is the category of respondents which have scored 9 or 10. And this is the group which is the most loyal and enthusiastic customers of the brand. The second one is called passives where the score is 7 or 8. This group of customers are satisfied but they are not satisfied to the same extent as the promoters. And the last group is called the detractors where the score is between 0 to 6. And this is an unhappy group and they are likely to either stop using your product or even go to the extent of encouraging others to stop using your product. Using this data you can then calculate the NPS score and to calculate the NPS score you need to subtract the percentage of promoters by the percentage of detractors and what will be left will be a number between minus 100 to 100 and that is the net promoter score for the brand that you are surveying. The benchmark for what really is a great NPS score is something that varies as you move from one category to the other. Typically a score above zero is considered uh, a score which is uh, good to have uh, while something above 50 or even 70 is considered to be like a great or an excellent score that you can have for your brand. While NPS is a great metric to follow, it isn't a guarantee of loyalty or referral. It is merely indicative of how loyal your customers are. And therefore, to make the best use of NPS, one should calculate the relationship between NPS and the achievement of certain marketing goals and other measures in parallel to NPS. Over time, what will happen is that you will get a good sense of the results that you can expect when the NPS score lies within a certain range. And secondly, NPS is symptomatic. It it provides a quick understanding of the loyalty and satisfaction without highlighting the real causes which are underlying. Certain brands, what they do is they include follow-up questions in the NPS survey itself. And this can give you a good sense of the reasons behind the scores that the customers are assigning to your brand. This makes the NPS result a lot more targeted and actionable. So by now I'm sure you're able to see some of the commonalities between these two terms, one coming from the field of epidemiology while the other coming from the field of marketing and uh, how the two of them are slightly similar but not exactly similar in a couple of ways. The thing to note over here is that while neither of these measures are kind of perfect to answer a lot of questions, but both of these measures are excellent starting points or indicative measures which can give you a broad sense of what really is going on. The second thing to note over here is that the quality of uh, the results when you are looking at both of these uh, kind of measures depends entirely on the quality of data which is used to arrive at these results. So if you are trying to calculate the NPS for your brand, Please make sure that you are taking a sample which is statistically significant but at the same time it is representative of the category and the brand's customers. The other thing which I find extremely interesting about both these measures is that when you calculate them over a period of time and at the same time draw the relationship between these measures and other measures which are important to you, you are able to almost arrive at a predictive way of understanding the relationship between these measures. Over a period of time, you should have some sense of the kind of sales you can expect when the NPS score moves up or down. 
And that brings me to the end of uh, today's video. As I said at the beginning, I am not a epidemiologist and I'm just a marketer who found this term from the world of epidemiology to be extremely interesting. And that got me thinking as to whether there is something in our own marketing world which can help us understand how likely is the brand going to be recommended by one person to more people. And uh, that kind of got me to try and dig deeper into what exactly is R0 and what exactly is NPS. I would love to hear what your thoughts are on uh, these measures. And if you have any anything to add or anything to suggest, please leave them in the comment section below. And if you liked what I shared in today's video, hit the like button and uh, share it with your friends. And once again, thanks a lot for watching the business of marketing and uh, do subscribe and I'll be sharing a lot more content in future.